live. Welcome to the ICAW Spreadsheets webinar. Okay, so I'm Aaron Westgate. Uh, I lead everything we do in terms of the ICAW at First Intuition, um, and I am a tutor here at First Intuition, and also I teach business strategy, um, bit of FM, SBM, uh, and audit, kind of my big ones and case study. Um, anything that revolves around audit strategy in case study is certainly my big things but um what you're going to see tonight is about spreadsheets or whatever you're watching this back if you are watching the recording um it's all about spreadsheets across the icw particularly um focusing on the courses that specifically have um, requirements for spreadsheets in it um whereas others in practically every exam there is a spreadsheet function you can have at professional and advanced level and you can use it um, as much as you want but the actual spreadsheet functions that you could be tested on, I want to cover. Um, and it looks a little bit like the top left that I've shown now. And what I'll do is I'll kind of go back and forth and show you a little bit of the ICW practice software at the same time, just so you kind of get a little bit of a vibe if you haven't done an exam already. So, let's click that. Right, um, I'll tell you a little bit about what's new. There's not actually that much new for this year, which is, is nice um, for you. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about what you need to know um, because there's some important things and how you might be assessed and also just kind of how you navigate things. So hopefully I can give you a few tips in terms of how things will be a lot easier for you once you start to know the spreadsheets and once you kind of get used to it. Um, and I always have to give a disclaimer that I mean, we're not allowed effectively to be ICAW examiners, um, but we do talk to them. Okay, so we do um, even a couple of weeks ago in what's this February, aren't we? So in Feb 2024, um, we were at the tutor conference, so we do talk to them and ask them pretty direct questions about stuff to kind of get a feel. Um, so we aren't the examiners, but we are pretty well informed, okay, pretty well informed. So I give my interpretation and also some of the team as well. So going straight into it, what you really need to know is we call it spreadsheets. It isn't Microsoft Excel, which is like when you call everything a Hoover, right? Hoover's a brand, um, but Microsoft Excel is the kind of Excel. This is called Spread.js, which is effectively a spread JavaScript. Um, it kind of looks a bit like spreadsheets. It doesn't look too far away from what you've seen before, um, but it does mean some of the functionality has been taken away. Um, part of that is effectively to make sure the software runs as smoothly as possible in the exam and partly because of the licensing and other things with the software that integrates with what the ICAW use. So um, these three exams you're going to see will always include spreadsheets. That's it. Every other exam includes the spreadsheet bit, but the three exams, financial management, business strategy and technology and strategic business management, they all will include spreadsheets and very likely a pre-populated spreadsheet at that okay so spread.js it's it's worth getting used to okay so there are some things that work very normally like um copy and paste right that works very differently but um you can't print anything from it right and you can't show a print preview which is one of the things that would have helped you actually in um this software so the things they actually cover are called data assimilation financial functions, statistical analysis. Some scary words, okay? But when we think about this, data assimilation, to assimilate just means to show effectively. So showing and visualizing stuff means being able to show the examiner your analysis, okay? So if you can show your analysis, um, then you're onto a winner, okay? Try and make it into a, a, something that looks like an analysis and not something that looks like a Control A, you've copied the whole workbook into their software. Okay. The financial functions are more about FM and SPM. Okay. And the statistical analysis is stuff that people don't like. Okay. Um, less commonly tested, but they do know that you don't like it. Okay. So it can come in um, as a specific uh, requirement, but also, they've given you some stuff that is statistical analysis, like standard deviation, and then asked you to build it into your answer, and everyone went, <gasps> I don't know what to say. Um, so, both sides. Um, but data assimilation is, the, I would say, is the most common one across um, BST and SBM, whereas financial functions is something that's effectively always going to come up in FM and SBM. Um, you don't have to use it, um, but it's certainly really helpful. 
So what I'm trying to do really is give you an overview of these things, tell you a little bit about what each one means and try and get you to think about how that might look in the exam, how you can structure your answers rather than being like, okay, let me show you how to do an if function because the ICW has a whole website full of videos on that. Google, chat, GPT, what Bard, all that other stuff, they are there if you want them. But really this is about, okay, what does it mean? How can it look? Okay, and how can you basically show the examiner exactly what you've done um, in the nicest possible way? So the spreadsheets, they include some functions, okay, of Excel. So as I said, I'll show you a little bit more about what that looks like, um, but it includes some functions of Excel. Um, the spreadsheet area is quite small. So if you haven't seen it before, it is quite small. You can make it bigger and you can move things around, um, which I will show you when we actually get to the software. And the, the thing that people are worry about is what if I delete the data? You can delete one set of the data, but there is a backup copy. Um, there is normally at least two tabs that you'll see. Um, you can't touch that one. You can copy it into your answer, um, but it's already copied usually over into the other R. So there is one you can edit, there is one you can't edit, just in case you worry that you've deleted all the data and now you, it asks you to do financial performance on data you can't see. Okay? That's not true. You can copy the data and there is a backup. Okay, so phew, no problem there. Okay, so what does data assimilation mean in terms of the specific spreadsheet skills that you need to know. So I've, I've broken these down into BST and SBM and FM in, in terms of columns. Um, there are three rows in the, um, three columns on the website for the ICW. They do tell you these. Um, so I just took a little screenshot of them just to show you. So BST and SBM, uh, average, you should all know practically what average is, okay? Um, we're talking effectively whatever the middle of the road is um, amongst all the values, okay? Mean if you wish. But the ones that we start to get down is, well, how would I use like count if and if and rank and sum and sum if and sum ifs, trend, okay? So how would you kind of use these? Well, count ifs is if you're looking at a number of items. So count if is effectively, if I wanted to not know the sum of things, the total of things, but I actually want to know how many times something happened. So I do this with pass rates, okay? How many students passed um, and I can use it, say, or count them if they're over 50, um, they're over 54. Okay, or count them if they include this data. And it tells me a, um, a total number of people, but not the total number. Because you imagine if I did that with an if function, it would tell me, oh, someone got 65, plus someone got 77, plus someone got 56, and it would add them all together. So a count if allows you to, for example, if you had something to do with the suppliers in the exam or customers, it'd be how many how many customers or how many times did this happen? You'd be able to find out using count if, okay? Rather than manually looking at it, okay? Count ifs is the same thing. Count ifs is just effectively count it if it includes this and this, okay? So if you said, um, is it, you know, is it red and is it below 10 or something? it would count something that's red and or below 10. Okay, So it would count it in that bundle. Um, so it gives you effectively two options you can use. But count ifs always looks more complicated. Anything with an S on the end looks more complicated. Equally with if statements, if statement is if it is this, then effectively show something, okay? So the similar to ifs with an S um, was added last year. Ifs is like, um, I kind of relate to GCSE results. So if it is 70% or over 70, you know, it's a grade seven, I think it is. If it's over 80, um, it's a grade eight and so on. So ifs allows you to have multiple things that a class has. Um, so like pass, merit, distinction. Okay, you'd have ifs in there. Okay. Um, so when you think about this, again, you might have, for example, discounts. So I was buying something earlier. Um, and it said, oh, if you spend over 50 pounds, you get 10% discount. And if you spend over 100, you get a 20% discount, okay, let's say. So that ifs with an S statement allows you to have multiple criteria okay, applying to it. The other one, which I've hopefully done, there you go, with a nice annotation, is called nested ifs. They, they, the star meant um, nested if statements. 
they're not as well used. Okay, so nested if kind of looks like an ifs statement. Okay, um, effectively, I, I always think about the audit exemption criteria. If you're a small company, there's three different criteria you can apply. And if you meet two of them, then um, you are exempt. Now, an ifs statement would, you'd have to have multiple ones of them. So a nested if is an if statement within an if statement. Okay, so you could say, well, if you, um, if you were over 10.2 million, say 10.2 million of revenue um, and 5.1 million assets, okay, you're under that, but then you had less than 51 employees. Okay, so if it met two of them, and that's when you'd use a nested if statement. Rank um, is simply to rank data. So all of these are, if you type in equals and then start typing the word in, it will pop up with the um, formula you can use, or you can use the formulas tab to find these. But the rank is, okay, well, if I want to know, I've got 50 suppliers and I want to rank them in terms of their percentage of on-time deliveries, I go equals rank, select what percentage I've got for this supplier, and then compare it to the rest of the percentage. So it, it is very simply a rank. Um, a rank from top to bottom, okay? Or you can do it in reverse, but um, you'll see that because right at the end it says, oh, do you want this in ascending order or descending order? Some if and some, so some is totaling up now. So when we talk about some, the difference is to count is some will total up. So if I try to do use that incorrectly on my, um, how many students pass, it would go up. Ah, you got 57 plus 75 passed so we go oh 120 something students passed um wherever that was 132 uh that's not what i wanted i wanted to know um in this case what's the total value so a sum is total it all up okay whereas a sum if is total it only if so only include it in the total okay so if i had a set of data and i want to know okay um if people bought this product did they buy it again? Or if people bought this product, how many of them bought it? Um, or how many items did they buy? So the sum if is I'll only include it and I'll only total it up. Um, and one of the things we recently saw with the BST was they said, and an SBM was, um, how many deliveries were late? And so you total, if the delivery was late, okay, then total up, okay? So you can add it and then you could total, that would be an uh, count if, and then you could total the number of days it was late also with a sum if. So lots of things you can do. Um, you're probably thinking, oh, he's getting scary. Um, sum ifs is the same thing. So if it meets both criteria, okay. So I would say something like, oh, okay. Uh, sum ifs for the number of students that um, passed all their mocks and their real exam. Okay, so I, that's the kind of analysis I would do. I want to look at, well, how many students failed and didn't do their mark, okay? And then I get that two, day, two sets of data. Uh, so that's the, the ones that sometimes sound more complicated. But when you actually look at them, they're okay, okay? Um, the problem, I call it a problem. The thing is what you're going to see this year, and this was highlighted in both sessions, is you are going to get more data OK, so you can imagine if you've got 15 rows now, you might get 50 rows of data. So be it, by doing it by eye has been something people have been able to do in the past. But now you're not going to be able to do so much like by eye or manual analysis. So getting used to these and particularly count ifs, sum ifs or just ifs, they are really handy and they're really common things that you'd actually use in the analysis. Okay, So getting used to them. Um, because that manual data, um, the manual analysis, that data is not really going to happen. So you can't, you can still filter and sort it by highest to lowest and stuff, but it's going to be harder. And that kind of reflects what real life is like now, doesn't it? Because you, the data you're dealing with, we're talking about tens of thousands or millions of transactions. We're not really talking in tens of data now. We're talking in, you know, big data terms. Um, the other one you can see right at the bottom is trend. Um, you can use this again. It's not as common, but trend is just looking at where it's going. OK, so some people use this with like a goal seek. Um, they say, OK, well, I want to know where is it going? So what was it trending to where? And effectively, I'd use that to say, what could the forecast be for that? 
Um, so you can see they are very much analysis questions. They are they are not really ones you're going to use in FM, but in SBM, in BST, where you're going to be doing some analysis of financial performance and operational performance, those are the ones really that you're going to need um, to analyze the data and show it back to the examiner. Okay, you don't need to do anything like graphs or anything like that, or lovely visualizations or pivot charts. Okay, they've mentioned specifically we don't need pivot charts. Okay, or pivot tables. Um, cool. Also with this, um, statistical analysis, not a long list, okay? Correlation, the way you figure this out equals correl, okay? I say, in most cases, if you start typing the word in the first couple of letters of the word that you want to do, there's usually a formula around it, okay? So equals correl is looking at how two data sets move with each other. So correlation of data. Nice and simple when you think about it, but the outcome is you need to know what it means when you see that it's minus one or plus one or something in between. So when you're looking at it, minus one means they move in opposite directions. So my audit hat goes up, oh, maybe materiality and sample sizes or population, um, but whereas population size and sample size might move in the same direction. So minus one means they move in opposites, plus one means they move in complete exactly the same way and the closer they get to zero means their correlation not so much zero means no correlation it means data are just plots all over the place there's not really anything you can see that matches it up so when you look at that again you might have two sets of data which might be the performance of something okay so um, how many customers bought this product like amazon you know amazon always says oh you recently bought customers also bought this um, and imagine, you know, I bought I've got my iPad in front of me. They go, customers who bought an iPad also bought some nappies. You think, is that really a correlation that we expect to see? Um, I say nappies because I have a, a fairly newborn child. Um, springs to my head. But so equals correl is how they move together. And it's actually quite a useful one if you're looking at analyzing why something happened. So how many deliveries were late with a, with a supplier and how many quality issues happened with them, maybe? Um, whereas standard deviation is scary, again, they can give you the standard deviation data or you can use it yourself. Um, we're looking at risk, right? We're looking at risk. So you might look at and say, well, how well could this, this share, this investment perform? Well, if it's the data spreads out more, it means it's more risky. So I could have really good performance or really bad performance. And so the further it is away from the mean, um, which is, to what it's suggesting, dispersion um, and also a deviation from the mean. Okay, it means it's more risky. Okay, so effectively the higher that number is, the more risky it is. But you use that as a relative relative to whatever mean you can see. So if you ever have to explain it, it's risk, it's dispersion, it's distance, um, it, it's from the mean. Uh, and then if you're scared about it, <laughs> you can stop there. So that's our BST, SBM, FM. They, they cover all of them. Um, they can, you know, they, they do get tested. Sometimes they're given to you as well. There you go. Added in 2023. Although the label for 2023 wasn't on there because I combined them. Um, financial functions, just SBM and FM because we're talking about MPVs and IRRs and all of that stuff, okay, and using present value. Um, again, only for those who are doing them or in future, they are very, very handy to do your um, to do your calculations in. And they can do it yourself, particularly the IRR um, or MIRR or XIRR. They are nifty little things that will save you quite a bit of time. Okay. So your um, again, this is not an FM and SBM course, uh, but IRR um, and MRR and XIRR. So MIRR is effectively um, when you use a different rate for the reinvestment rate. Okay, so IRR assumes that you reinvest in the cost of capital, but MIRR then assumes that you um, or you give a specific rate to investor. Okay, so it allows you to adjust the IRR function. Uh, whereas XIRR means, well, you might have a set of dates that the cash flows are coming in, whereas IRR would assume they're all at the year end, um, and th therefore XIRR allows you to adjust all that stuff, um, which you've had to do manually in the past, um, over the years, but now, 
um, as of last year, you can bring that. So you think about the amount of rows and entries you'd have to put in uh, into a calculator and do all that um, for XRR and MRR. Now you can just do it in spreadsheets. Uh, MPV, very simple. Um, you just need discount rate, um, the cash flows, blah, blah, boom, it's pretty much done. Um, but again, obviously there are some things you need to be careful of. It, uh, for example, if it doesn't start, um, cash flows start, don't start in uh, T1. Okay. Again, if you've done FM, that will mean something. If you haven't, um, wait until you, you get to FM. Uh, power, it just means effectively like square root, cube root, all that stuff. So um, it's a bit more difficult to do uh, square roots and all that stuff um, or squaring a number. So power just means you do something to the power of. Okay, So equals power allows you to um, uh, square something, cube something, or whatever the fourth one is uh, as well. Uh, equals PV is present value, um, so equivalent to MPV, except not considering the initial cash flow. Again, um, look at that for FM. And rate is to find the effective rate. Okay, so you're usually using this um, more so at FM, but you can also use it for, um, uh, for FM, but more so for SBM. Uh, this is effectively just finding the effective rate. So a bit more complicated, things like cost of debt. Uh, again, I don't plan on showing them. They are, I consider the financial functions as ways to save time in the exam, as opposed to what we saw before, which is actually just to demonstrate the data. Okay. Um, so it means you don't have to go on your calculator, write, um, type it all in, and then go on um, and write out your workings in Word. You can demonstrate your workings using the Excel spreadsheet you've already used. Okay. So it should save time, but it's getting used to it. Okay, and so hopefully your tutors, when they teach you, they'll show you a mixture of um, manual and also a bit of spreadsheets as well. But none of that in BST, because even though MPVs has a little bit of assumed knowledge, it's not there. Okay. okay, so that's the main list. That's the spreadsheet functions. What I would say at this point is you're thinking, right, so they're going to ask me to do a standard deviation calculation? No, right? The aim of them is to support your questions, support your answers, and to be able to analyze or do calculations. So they can ask you to do, in FM, a net present value calculation. Now, that is obviously directly asking for the same syllabus content, but you could use spreadsheets to do it. Whereas in SBM and BST, what we're really looking at is they will facilitate your answers. It's unlikely that you're going to be asked to use a standard deviation formula or an average formula. It's there to facilitate your analysis okay, and facilitate your answers. So that's one thing worth clarifying is that even though they're in the syllabus, it's not something we expect. They're going to test you on directly. Okay? So they want to build it into their questions. It's like a toolkit. Okay? And the toolkit that I absolutely do not need, um, I, I know how to use the spreadsheet toolkit, I absolutely do not need to use and know how to use the toolkit that sits behind that door in my garage. Um, but a few extra things. Sort function. This was added in 2024. Okay. Um, effectively, what we mean is just sorting data. It was added. It's not on the ICW website. I don't know why. Um, but sorting data is added in 2024, uh, which I'm sure you might know how to do. Under the data tab, you can filter and you can also sort. Okay. Um, so if you wanted to manually do something, which they are saying you won't be likely to do anymore, but that you might be able to do that, click a couple buttons and sort the data. Absolute cell references, um, if you didn't know, is where if you want to use the same formula and carry something, so if you wanted to apply sensitivity analysis and say, okay, well, I want to use the same discount rate or the same, same percentage, like um, you typed in the uh, audit exemption thresholds and compared it to a bunch of companies listed, you want to absolute the cells you want to keep the same. So if I wanted to compare this row, but to static set of rows above, I would use an absolute cell reference, which is usually um, uh, like FNF4, Control F4, something like that. Um, it depends on the keyboard. Um, you could use that. Okay. And formatting, they like it to look nice, but absolutely you need to make things stand out. Okay. So they want to be able to see the difference between your analysis and the data they were originally provided. Um, so things like put it in bold, put it in red if you want. They don't mind it being in red. They'd probably mind if it was in yellow because I can't really see it, right? But um, they want to be able to see and stand out your data. So otherwise they have to go, okay, well, where, which bits of yours are within this analysis? 
So decimals are nice. You don't get any, you don't really get many marks for it. Um, you might occasionally get a knowledge mark for the layout of your tables, um, but it would depend on the type of question you're really looking at. Okay, so you might get a, a knowledge mark uh, in BST and SBM. We talk about them a bit more. And then, yeah, bold titles and all that. Okay, just stuff that you would hopefully do in, um, in reality. Okay. Good. Right. Okay, 2024 updates then. So some big things that you need to know for this year. Um, there can be some very big calculations. Okay, but sorry, very big questions. Uh, so when I put here up to 50 marks, that means the question, you know, an SBM, you can have a 60 marker and a 40 marker, let's say. So we're talking, it could be a big component. You can use it quite a lot, okay? But they can have some big questions that include a spreadsheet element, okay? So they're gonna be looking at skills, they're gonna be using calculations, there's gonna be a lot of data, okay? But there can be some big, big questions. They've also said there's gonna be larger data sets, which I mentioned earlier, and they're very likely they're gonna be pre-populated. What they want to do is see what you can do with data they've already given you, rather than get you to regurgitate and write up manually data that they've, they've already provided in PDF. Okay. So bigger data sets. That will look in terms of more rows. They are less likely to do columns because when they, um, when they get marking uh, your lovely answers, if it goes all the way off here, it makes it a bit harder for them to mark. So they, they are very conscious that you probably shouldn't analyze things in columns. It will still see it, it will always get marked, but it makes it look a little bit skewed from their side. So they're not gonna encourage lots of columns um, by giving you 50 columns as well. They are gonna give you more data in rows. And it kind of follows the, um, what we'd normally see in terms of analysis. You'd want to use what we call um, the 1NF format. Okay, so first normal format, uh, which I'll mention a bit later. So the spreadsheet, will only be the pre-populated part particularly will only be in one question across any of them. Okay, so you can use it in all of your questions for your calculations, for your analysis, but in terms of you're gonna get one pre-populated spreadsheet. So one, one spreadsheet. The other thing you're gonna see is more varied requirements. Okay, so what we've seen so far can be pretty well distilled into financial performance analysis, or operational performance analysis. In that, that is in BST and SBM. In FM, not so much, okay? Bit of data here and there. But what you're gonna see is more granular data, more focused questions. So things like um, you would have seen maybe at the end of this year, they started doing questions like, um, here's two queries from the director of the company, you need to answer them. So they do that more so in SBM before, but they're bringing that into BST as well. Okay, so the same with FM, they'll say, okay, I'm, I'm really concerned about risk. So I want you to factor that into your analysis and your answers. Okay, and that's, that's the specific and focused questions they're looking at. Similar to in the past, they've done in BST and SBM, they've said that, okay, produce a, a break-even analysis. It's the same thing, but for spreadsheet purposes. Um, and then the other thing is, say, supporting calculations. Um, so it might be that you use the data for multiple questions. Um, but absolutely set more spreadsheets, more data, more ways that you, if you're good at this, you can really pick up some really good marks. So those are the kind of big updates for 2024, okay? Bigger data, bigger questions, more granular questions in particular, more specific questions. So it does touch on how you can be assessed, Okay. And what I've done is taken a bunch of screenshots from questions that are on the ICW website that you should all be able to access anyway. Okay. So some of the, the questions you will be able to see, um, I said, directly through pre-populated spreadsheets, that's going to be the most common one. That's right? the most common one you're going to see. But it could also be supporting calculations. Um, and what I mean by supporting calculations is you might have something like probability analysis or they've given you a little bit of data. Let's say in the past, they gave you like the prices. I was doing a question called Nyon today, just um, having a quick look at it, because um, some analysis for it. And they gave you the price of data for different sectors, some analysis of different countries' performance, and that stuff will still remain likely in the PDF. They're not expecting that every bit of numbers and data they give you will go into a spreadsheet. Okay, so some bits of data will remain and might be visually shown, 
in the PDF, okay? but you can do some supporting calculations on it. By some of it, you can copy and paste from the PDF into your Excel, okay? And then you can analyze it as you wish. The other bit is obviously by choice. So how can you assess? Um, but this is really, you can choose to use them as much as you want, okay? So um, the only exception to that, which I'll remind you at the end, is do not write your full answers in Excel, okay? I, I, I'm seeing much more of this um, as I teach um, these kind of subjects a lot and just across anything that we're writing in Excel and then copying and pasting it into Word. Um, do not do that, okay? Do not do that. You can do your analysis in Excel, um, but not your writing, okay? And that is a, uh, a plea from the examiners, a very, very, I mean, like almost begging, please stop putting answers in Excel and copying them in. So what are these questions going to look like? Okay, so here's some from the past years. So using the data in a pre-populated spreadsheet, which is usually highlighted in bold, so you really do see it, um, evaluate the performance. That is a financial performance question that will come up, won't be an FM, okay? But very, very common type of question, also in case study, it should be a really easy question. The big issue is time management on that because you can do loads of stuff. So they all say things like assimilate. Don't be freaked out by the word assimilate, just show them, okay? So analyze it and show them the data by product type, by region. That is a very, very classic question. Um, the, the most classic you could get in BSC and SBM is that performance analysis, particularly financial performance. So that's the easy one, okay? Should be very, very good at that one. The ones where we start seeing a bit more disperse, um, oh, dispersed, standard deviation, um, a bit more variation in answers is here. This is what I call more of an operational analysis question. So it's not about financial data per se, but they're giving you information about a customer, a supplier, a contract, let's say, and getting you to analyze it. This is where I would say, take note of these questions and practice lots of them, because these are more business analysis questions that you might have to do um, in now or in later life I and mean, in practice in industry, wherever you are, uh, they are really helpful things if you can analyze data, because you're not spending all your time doing ratio analysis, which is effectively that last question. So they want to see much more broad things. So in this case, it says respond to the queries from the board. So that's that focused granular question and identify the workshop codes. So you can see the codes um, and evaluate and compare the performance of these divisions. So this is imagine, imagine these were um, I mean, this is like financial performance, but this is right, this type of workshop in this division. And so now you need to match up divisional performance. So in here, you've got division in this workshop, but you've got two divisions in A, two in B, and multiple below. So you now you're saying, well, if it is in A, then add up the revenue. If it is in A, add up its operating profit. If it is in A, compare the size of the workshop to its annual revenue, something like that. So you can see I'm counting if it is this, I'm summing if it is this, and all of that stuff will allow me to analyze it. But you could have sorted the data, but it's gonna come harder and harder to do that when you've got big sets of analysis. You've also then got calculations. So this could be any of them. Right, so this is where we could have any kind of calculation data. And this is, I pulled this one out because they specifically said, ah, oh, students just hated this, right? So mean, standard deviation, costs. This is the bit where it caused some more issues. And they just said the board has risk appetite, a limited risk appetite, and they want you to, they're concerned about variability and losses. So they give you specific comments and it says, compare the relative profits and the risks. Well, remember standard deviation is a measure of risk, right? So standard deviation, well, the higher it is away, then the higher risk is. Right? We're also missing a bit of data, as you can see from note three, which has its own bit of analysis. But this is where you start to see specific calculations where they didn't give it in a spreadsheet, but you could have used it. You didn't really need to copy it um, into the data set. You, you could have, it might format a bit weird, um, but you could have copied it across and done some analysis. But in this case, they've given you the standard deviation. 
So there wasn't an expectation of analysis. They could give you MPVs and IRRs and all that kind of stuff. And that's something they're looking at more and more is to give you the answers to something. And effectively, you need to tell them what it is showing. So you're not doing the analysis, but you're telling them what it actually, um, what it actually demonstrates, which is quite a hard skill because okay? it, feel, it feels obvious. You don't want to tell them the obvious things. Um, but yeah, always tell them the obvious, always, always. In FM and SBM, you've got more specific calculations. So money cash flows, calculate the MPV. Um, again, if you haven't done FM or SBM, you have possibly no clue what that means. So don't worry. But they gave you a little bit. Um, again, this might not be in a spreadsheet, um, but they gave you the data and for you to use three years and you calculate the MPV. That's what a financial function is a specific calculation. And finally, from memory, it's finally, um, spreadsheet versus manual write-up. This is where, again, I say you can choose. This data is in the PDF. It's not in the best format for you to copy and paste. So you can e easily do, okay, well, if I know that the best case is 75%, what well, I'm going to do equals 0.75 times the revenue for that. Okay. So you can start to break down um, and use probability analysis, let's say. OK, so expected MPVs, expected values. Um, this is a choice. You didn't have to show it in Excel spreadsheet. You could write this up in Word. And so the kind of key part of this is check what works for you. You know, if, if you find that actually you don't really like doing these kind of questions in spreadsheets, then don't like do it in Word. Do it on a calculator and write it up. If you find that you're quicker at doing it in Excel, then do it in Excel and copy it in. OK, so it's, it's about seeing what you want to do. Um, for these manual write-up. I, I call them manual write-up because you'd have to copy the data from the PDF. But we're not expecting you'll get big data sets in the PDF anymore. Um, the main things will be like little snapshots like this and little visualizations. The visualizations you cannot copy. You can't snipping tool, which I love, love the snipping tool. You can't use that and just ping it into your spreadsheet or the Word document. So, I showed you a few variations, okay, five or six. The ICW workbooks, um, which you should have access to, have, I think for BST, they have about eight different practice questions on the website and a bunch more. Okay, so they have, for every spreadsheet function, there is a video on it. Okay, and I'll show you that in a bit. For every type of question and function, there is also an example of a type of question that we'll focus on. OK, in the work, but there are some that are more specific. OK, so they might say use standard deviation and that's more just to get you to use it than it is to reflect what a real question could look like. OK, so um, if you can't see anything also in your, let's say, SBM workbook, you can have a look in BST if you have access to it. So we we're quite happy. You know, if you're studying with us and you do an SBM, we could share the FM or SBM workbook with you as well. So you should be able to find an example. Um, within the ICW, okay, or ask your tutors. Good, so we're getting there. Okay, so um, check the chat. How should I show my workings? And this is the bit you're probably most thinking, right, I need to nail down this. Um, you need to show them clearly. So let's start with that, right? This is an answer. Um, if you're in my class next week, don't look at the numbers because we're going to actually do this question, um, I think. Uh, so percentage changes is you can see the analysis that we did is in red. Very clearly, I can see that. Obviously, you wouldn't copy the question up there, um, but this is the kind of thing that you would show the examiner. Percentage changes, and you can copy that. You do not need to explain to the examiner that you checked the change in revenue from 2021 to 2020. They can assume you know what you're doing with that. OK, but obviously you would need to show that it's a percentage um, or the pound amount. OK, or if you're in case studies, both of them, really. Um, but show it in red and it shows exactly what analysis you've done. So the revenue, the data analysis questions, um, particularly the financial ones, are really easy to get that um, distinction. But you can see here gross profit margin. The examiner's unlikely to give you that. So highlight it, show them that you've done it and you'll get knowledge marks, usually a half mark for every calculation you've done. Um, you don't have to use it in your answer, but you can pick up. 
there will be a cap on the amount of marks. So do not go overboard on the number of calculations you do and then effectively not write much about it because there are so only so many knowledge marks you can pick up, okay? And they're usually 20 to 25% of your marks in a BST and effectively even lower in SBM. So that's your data analysis, financial stuff. The operational stuff is where they start to say, I want you to assimilate. I want you to show me an analysis. I do not want all your data. With a caveat, which we'll talk about. So this is saying how many were late, how many were on time, how does that compare to their key performance indicators? So they might have had a performance indicator that 95% of deliveries should be on time or 99% of the time I've seen in the past, the system should be um, working. In this case, they want you to show the data as if you were reporting it to someone who wants to know that exact figure, okay? So if you said how many are late and how many are on time, but then you didn't show the KPI, yet you knew that 95% was KPI, you're not really assimilating what they want you to do. So you really need to show this bit. You can copy all of your data in, and that is fine, but there are caveats to that. But what they really want to see is this. So the same with if you wanted to do, for the last question, you could show 2021 um, increase, um, decrease. You could show it as plus and minus. You could just show that analysis common, but what you find in these questions, is it's actually really easy to just plonk your numbers on the side of it. Whereas in an operational performance question, it's not as easy to do that. So they want you to copy this um, and show them just this data, but they are happy if you want to copy the rest of the data, but just try and put this at the top. So they know this is where they'll be looking for give you marks for, okay? So this is where you're analyzing the data, right? They're asking you to analyze the performance of the supply deliveries. As you start to look into more financial functions, so if you were to use um, a formula, and that goes to any formula, not just financial ones, they want you to show this. You do not need to say formula used in Excel in cell H19. They don't know which cells you've used. They don't know the columns and the row numbers, okay? So even if you copy the data, they won't know what it is. So you just need to just copy this formula and say equals MPV 0.1, and then say the cash flows, okay? I know they can't see the, the rows you've used, but they will be able to figure it out. The only exceptions I'd say to that are things like where you specifically know that you should have adjusted something. So if you've used all their data, but actually they know you shouldn't apply the MPV um, discount percentage to a certain cash flow, you need to effectively say ignoring X cash flow. And that is where I will allow you to write in the Excel, okay? And you can do that, you can write it in the Word just below it, or you can write in the Excel and that's fine, but you don't need to use formula use. Just say and show the examiner what formula you can write it next to it or something like that. And again, you can show formulas and copy that, which again, I can show you um, in a few minutes. So with these, when you've got more calculations, you are looking similar to a calculator itself, but you can automate things quicker. So it still is quicker if you like it. So that basically covers my manual explanation, right? So the, the formula you said, I said at the bottom, explain, you can show your formula, copy the formula into the Excel to show it next to your data. Okay? Or you can say MPB formula use 10% discount back, um, on all cash flows or all cash flows except. So something you can explain, um, the same with if formula, you don't really need to explain the if formula. So then there are there is knowledge marks for your your um, the way it looks and the um, assimilation part of it. So does it look and analyze the data? Um, not necessarily for the specific functions you've used. Whereas the equals MPV is more about demonstrating your knowledge. So you would pick up marks a bit quicker with that. So you can manually explain it to say what you've done, but you can also copy and paste show formulas, right? So there is. Um, there is a way you can do this, but it's not as easy as when I um, ran this webinar two years ago. And I said, okay, you can show formulas. Um, and we've talked to the examiners back and forth and they're like, yes, but we can't really see the rows. We can't see the columns. And therefore it, it kind of loses the value. 
So I wish it was that easy. You could just show formulas, but the columns and rows don't copy. You can do this in Excel, Microsoft Excel, because you can include the row and column numbers when you show formulas and copy something, but Spread.js doesn't allow you to do that. So you can manually do it. The other way you can do it is formula text. So if you ever use this for equals formula text, it changes anything that uses a formula, it changes it into, um, and it shows the formula itself. So it's kind of has a similar format to um, showing formulas. Okay, so you just go equals formula text. And what you do is instead of cop um, you copy it across and you say equals formula text, show me the formula I've used in the column next to it. Um, and it basically means it saves you having to manually write out the formula. Again, when, uh, when I've used this in the software, it doesn't always work as easily just manually writing equals formula text. So you can just use the formulas tab to do the formula text. Again, all of this, um, probably a good time to actually show you some of that. So if I scroll to my Excel, um, my lovely spread, sorry, spread JS, we should call it. So on the software, okay, this is just one of the 2022 exams, okay, which is on the website. It looks like this. Now, you need to figure out, aside from spreadsheets, you need to figure out how to move stuff around. It's pretty easy. It's pretty quick. So number one is if you don't need to see the requirement anymore because you've read it, get rid of it there. Okay, so you don't need to see that tab. You can then move stuff across. So you can drag that across nice and easily. It pops up only to so far, okay? So you can drag it up, but you can still access everything if you need it. If you're using just a spreadsheet at the moment, they do have lots of make sure you've copied it. Because if you don't copy it, it will not be marked. The examiner cannot see it. They can't go into the software and see it. If you haven't copied it like some students have in the past accidentally or they forgot, it won't get any marks. Okay, particularly, particularly, particularly important if you are someone that likes writing in Excel, you would lose your whole question. Okay, so if that doesn't scare you enough, um, then I don't know what will. So you can drag up the word part, the word processing area. Okay, again, not Microsoft Word. And if you want to make it even bigger, you can just click here and it will pop up. For that. So in this question, you've got financial data. And then you've got this one where this is a duplicate, you cannot um, edit it, okay? So if you accidentally did that, I don't know what the revenue figure is anymore. You can click Control-V if you did it like that. I can't show that on the webcam. Um, and then you could as well just go copy that across, okay? So you can just copy the data if you need. So even in here, nice and simple, um, if I wanted to do this divided by this, um, obviously it give me 1.34, it's not really a good analysis, is it? So then I might go, oh, well, right, I'm gonna minus one. Again, doesn't really give me much. Um, so I might go, ah, okay, well, I now need to go, well, what should it look like? Well, I need to turn that into percentage. There you go, et voila, done. Okay, so you could quickly click and done. Now I can see it. I can see exactly what I've done. I don't need to put up here, this is my analysis, okay? they can see this is your analysis. So year, um, you can do 2020, 20X1, they called it, 20X1 versus 20X0. Et voila, and you can see it. So you've got that, and you can roll it down. You can do the same things as normal, so you can script, script it down. And this is where absolutes might come in. If you were gonna use, right, I want to know cost of sales relative to revenue, you need to maintain the absolute, okay? But all of this stuff, you can see here. But what you could do, as said, is you can use um, formula text. So you could show formulas, look, look that magical thing. I mean, that's not a formula, is it? Um, but you'd use an if statement. So you can click this back and forth and you could copy and paste that. But it doesn't really tell them much, okay? Because they don't know what B6 are and they don't know what C6 are, okay? So you can do that. Um, you can use any of the functions that are in here, the average, the if so you go, you can see um, the formula text um, that sits within these as well. So you can use all of them, okay? The only way really, realistically, you can copy all the data um, and show them exactly what's happening is you would have to do something like this. 
you would have to say to the examiner, these are the rows and these are the columns. And you'd have to go B, C, D, E. Okay, so I'd have to go to them, right. These are B, C, D, E as columns. And then this is row, and I'd start it from here. So this is row six. And I go, okay, this is row six. Again, put it in red. Um, and then I can drag that down. If you just drag it down normally, it does that, which you might know from Excel. But if you hold control and you drag it down, again, you can see the list. So I could technically do that and they can see. And then I can go, oh, where am I? There we go, show formulas and then copy and paste it. What I don't want to do is start going right, bam. I'm going to copy all of this. You can imagine the examiner trying to mark this and they've got a hundred thousand rows or however many it allows for them to copy. Only copy the rows that are relevant, the an analysis you've done that's relevant. So copy this across, um, whatever analysis you've done, copy that, right? Bring it up here and it doesn't matter if it doesn't look really pretty, okay? It doesn't matter that all these, these outlines of the tables, they are fine with that. But you can see here, and I said, I wouldn't expect you necessarily to do this unless you are a wizard and quick at doing it. But I can see like, I can go row six, column B, and now I'm starting to demonstrate this out of which column's which, right? And so when they say, oh, it's C6, yes, they'll know what I'm talking about, okay, a bit more, but it does still make it harder work for the examiner, okay? So they still know what I'm doing. So for this kind of question, the ratio analysis, I wouldn't do it because you don't need, they don't need to know how you got from here to here to compare it. It's when you do stuff like ifs, count ifs, nested ifs, or sum ifs, all that stuff, where they're like, I don't know what data you've used. Maybe you'd be a bit more tempted to do this. But obviously this takes time, okay? Um, and this isn't something if you are very, very struggling, um, very, very strict on time, great. But if you are someone that struggles with time, this is not something I would expect you want to do, okay? Because this, this kind of question will eat away at a lot of time in the exam. So that's a, a way you can do it, okay? So there's a couple of different things. Um, they do have lots of stuff on the website. I said, if you want to start using the spreadsheet functions, they're all up there. So I'll quickly pop back in here before um, we kind of finish up. But hopefully that makes a bit more sense. So the key, key things I say is, make sure you use the software because as you can see you have to you have to know how it works right you have to know how to move things around and copy and paste um all that stuff okay it works very very similar to excel it's just limited in its use so know what it does and doesn't do okay so if you've got this magic thing you always use and you haven't tried it in the practice software and you go on exam day you're like oh i use control t to make it into a table object that might not work okay so you have to test it first you have to copy your spreadsheet, okay? You have to do it. Don't copy the whole worksheet, which I just said. Um, and that shows that you're copying the data. It is fine to copy all of your data, even if the assimilation bit is the main bit, put that at the top, put it in bulk if you want. Um, then you, if you're thinking, oh, I want to make sure they know exactly what I've done, yes, you can copy the rest of your data in below, okay? But the main thing they're really gonna be looking at is the analysis, okay? And the stuff that gets you the marks. But if you feel, you know, like a teddy bear, you feel like I want that back up just in case. Yes, you can copy the rest. You can copy numbers, OK, and PDF stuff across. Um, again, I want to demonstrate that quickly. Um, so if you wanted to copy in even these words. So if there was something relevant here and you want to copy into your spreadsheet, um, you can see it. It does look all in one row, but you can do the same with data. OK, so you could pick up the data element of this, not one of them uh, visualizations, because remember, we can't copy these. Um, but you could pick up some of the data that was in a possible table. OK, so here you go, average license fee. Um, but it doesn't always look that pretty. OK, um, and we do like stuff to look nice. So you can see here it did work, annual license fee and 250. So I can see that I could have used that. So again, it was pretty quick to do that. I said, 
you can copy writing numbers. You can't copy the visualizations in the tables. They don't expect you to do charts or anything like that. Like I said pivot tables, which they've seen before. They don't expect that, right? They're just, they're not testing that. They don't expect you to do that. And it's all about answering your way, right? It's not about what other people do and how they do things. So if you still think, actually, I do an MPB quicker on my calculator, then do it on your calculator. Um, but I say there's some things I think are generally uh, a bit quicker in a spreadsheet for most people. You have to think about your workings. OK, like anything, if you don't have any workings, they don't know where things came from. Um, there is kind of an assumption, though, however, if you are someone that, you know, if you get things right, they will effectively assume that you've made all the workings correctly because that that kind of makes sense. Right. If you get the right answer, your workings must be there. So they will. Um, typically assume if they see the right answer at the end, they would give you the full marks for everything. But the big problem is, it's like how often do people get 100%? Not very. The the um, the big big you know the prize winning stuff at professional level might be in the 90s. Okay, at advanced level it might be in the 80s, but we're not expecting that you're going to get 100%. So it is always worth having your workings in there. Okay, but it's about doing it, highlighting them clearly. And making sure they know what you can see, um, what you've done. And my big plea on behalf of the examiners is don't write in your spreadsheets except very, very small little explanation. I've used, you know, just equals MPV. Um, not even I have used MPV, it's just equals MPV. They're not expecting you to write anything in there um, except, as I say, like headers, right? or you know, analysis, something like that, where you're explaining um, or stating, should I say, your analysis. They do not expect you to write in it. They really, really hate it because it makes it so hard to mark for them. Um, so I don't know why we'd ever want to make their, their lives harder. They would mark it, okay, they will mark it, but you can imagine they're not very happy when they have to do that. Um, so that was a plea from the Tutor Conference as well. So the final bit is really um, read the website, ask your tutor, but there's definitions, explanations, video demonstrations, all that stuff is on the website. OK, so I'll show you it here um, on the date. If you type in data analytics, ICAW or data analytics software or something like that, you will get to here. And it shows you the, uh, the inflow software that's for audit assurance and corporate reporting and also the spreadsheet stuff. And it has all of the different bits that I explained today, okay, all of those little tables and stuff. All of that is here. And the other bit you can see is the spreadsheet functions because exclusive content uh, which students can get um, if you're a, I assume you're an ICW student and it has all the functions explained and they keep going down and down all in videos, okay? So you can see an example of how to use this. So it's all there with testing um, and for every specific module, uh, so BST, FM, SBM, let's say, um, all of those modules are there where you can go, OK, I'm going to go back to BST ones and do the specific questions that they give me in the practice questions under spreadsheets. OK, so Bessie's Burgers is one of them. So you get the spreadsheets and the answers to that um, so you can practice them yourself. Of course, as I said, if you're in a tuition course like um, or a vision course with us and stuff, we'll help you along the way. But all of that is there. There's only so much you can do in that time. Good. Oh, there you go. End on a smiley face. Okay. So um, for anyone listening this back and for those that attended um, uh, that long list of you as well, um, then thank you for listening. If you have any questions, I'll turn off the video. Um, but for all of you in the chat and stuff, we'll carry on if you wish. Um, but yes, feel free to ask any comments. Feel free to um, send us messages, first intuition. Feel free to Find me up. I think I'm on TikTok now. TikTok now. So uh, um, I, I do try and share some some happy, um, some good tips on there. Otherwise, thank you for listening.